Well, if you're a guest here today, or maybe you've only been here for a few times and haven't picked up one of the gifts that we have for you, today we have a basket uh, or a, a bag that has some, uh, some gifts from the church for you, and I hope you'll stop by on the way out if you didn't get one on the way in and pick one of those up. As Stephen mentioned, he and Allison will be in the lobby for prayer, but also if you're a first-time guest, just introduce yourself to him, and behind the card, he'll grab you a bag and give that to you, because we'd love for you just to have that to remember uh, Grace Church, and as you um, really hear the message today and really see why you need to be connected to a local church, I hope this will remind you that Grace is here to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Here at Grace, we've been teaching through the book of 2 Corinthians, and several people have asked me, if, am I going to continue on 2 Corinthians? And the answer is absolutely, because the resurrection impacts every single page of the Bible. Every scripture is impacted by the resurrection. And we call it this, it's called the second letter of Corinthians because there's another letter in our Bible called 1 Corinthians. And so Paul wrote letters to the Corinthians, and we have two of those letters. And so we're working through that book of 2 Corinthians. And one reason we do books of the Bible here at Grace Church is because the Holy Spirit sets the agenda for what we're going to talk about rather than, you don't want that on me, okay? All right, so election season's coming. You don't want me talking up here, all right? So the Holy Spirit uses me to speak his word, I deliver the mail, and that's my job as the pastor, and the word is from God. And so today, um, as we celebrate the resurrection, I do want to remind you, even though sometimes Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday can feel like the Super Bowl of the church world, it really, every week is a celebration of the resurrection. Every week, the first Sunday, the Sunday, the first day of the week, we get together and celebrate Jesus Christ, and that's why oftentimes at Grace, you'll hear us say, the expression, it's all about Jesus, because it truly is all about Jesus every single day of the week. And so as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then we'll, in a minute we'll jump into 6 where we left off, I want to just remind us of the resurrection power and how that Christ's resurrection can honestly impact your life in very, very practical ways. And so as we look at chapter 5, we looked at this a few weeks ago, I want to go back and revisit this, this verse Let's pray before we do. Father God, we thank you for today that we can gather as your church in this place. And God, we thank you for the people that you have brought here today uh, in celebration of the resurrection. God, we pray for anyone here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior. God, today may be their day of salvation. Thank you for Forrest and just uh, him being baptized today and just the miracles that you worked in his life. And God, you long to work that in everyone's life in here in this room. And God, we thank you for your pursuit of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 15 says this, For the love of Christ controls us, and some versions say compels us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And the picture in the baptism, the old life is gone. The old life is dead. We're dead to the old life. And he died for all that those who live or those who receive this new life in Christ might no longer live for themselves, but now we live for him for whose sake died and was raised. And so Jesus Christ died and was raised so that we could live no longer for ourselves, but we live for Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul here, who's writing this passage of Scripture, he's overwhelmed with Jesus' love for him, and he reciprocates that love to Jesus Christ by extending control to Jesus of every area of his life, that Jesus controls everything. The love of Christ, the, the relationship that he has with Jesus Christ, controls everything about his life. And if you're here today and maybe you feel like, you know, at one point in your life you experienced Jesus or you had a moment of, you know, coming to the front and making a decision for Jesus or so on, but since then it's been a pretty much, you felt very indifferent to him. Maybe what happened in your life isn't significant anymore. This message is definitely for you. And if you're here today with lots of questions about Jesus, why he matters so much, why we say things like it's all about Jesus, and you maybe even be a little bit skeptical of everything that's happened so far and everything that happens in the church world, this message is for you as well. Because the author of 2 Corinthians, which was the Apostle Paul, was also a skeptic. In fact, he went to the point where he was persecuting Christians in the name of his religion, in the name of Judaism, in the name of God. He was taking Christians and arresting them. Some were even killed 
until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then everything changed. And so if Paul, as a murderer, could come to Jesus and have his sins forgiven, you're definitely not too sinful to come to Jesus today. The resurrection can truly, honestly change your life. And today's sermon is an invitation to open your mind to those who may be skeptical, to those who feel away from God. Today is an invitation for you to see Jesus again. For those of you who are walking with Jesus, to be reminded of the most towering figure in all of history, which is Jesus Christ, and the difference that he can make in our lives if we will listen to his words. In fact, in the, in the words of Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read verses 28 through 30. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Doesn't that sound good? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so this is an invitation from Jesus to come and to receive a gift, to be yoked or connected with Jesus Christ himself. Throughout Scripture, you, if you read the Bible, you see lots of metaphors, lots of pictures to help explain spiritual truths. Well, Roy, if you'll pass me that little uh, device I gave you a second ago, just a really rough visual for what a yoke was, because it's not something we use on farms today. It's not something that's useful even in our minds we may not understand. But I have a picture in just a second you can see of what it looked like, a yoke, during the times of ancient times when Paul would have been writing this and Jesus would have been talking, where you would have oxen joined up together, connected together, harnessed together through an apparatus. And this would be typically where farmers would take a younger, less experienced ox and, and he would connect it to a more experienced ox in order for the stronger, more experienced ox to lead the way, to guide the younger ox. And so you see in this case that Jesus says, he uses this picture, he uses this very visual thing that people would have gotten and understood. He says, if you feel heavy laden and beat down and tired, take my yoke upon you. He says, I want you, he invites people, come and join me. And he says, I'll be the leader because I'm stronger, of course. Jesus is stronger. I'm going to take the burden off you. I'm going to train you and teach you how to live this life in a way where you can find joy and rest. And he write, invites everyone who says that, you're, that you feel like you're labored or heavy laden. Now, some people are in touch with that feeling. And some people, maybe at this moment, you feel like you have life by, you know, by the horns. You, you're like things are going so well for you and your life and your business is successful, family's going great. And honestly, you can say, you know, I just, I'm here today because this is where you're supposed to be or I came with family. But the truth is, I don't really feel this labor or this heavy laden spirit that you're talking about. And so Jesus offering me rest, I don't really feel like I need rest. I don't need, feel like I need to be harnessed to Jesus because I'm feeling pretty good right now. Well, let me just say this. Life has an interesting way of getting your attention, does it not? And if you've been alive for very long, you know that's the truth. If you're in your teens or 20s, you may not have experienced that at this point. But it's somewhere down the line, something's going to occur, something's going to happen that's out of your control. You realize that most of life is outside of your control, and you're going to realize that life can make you feel heavy, and you can feel like you're laboring. And so Jesus is talking to people, not saying, those of you who are this way, he's saying, those of you who are in touch with this, those of you who understand and have come to the comprehension that life and trying to earn God and make God happy through your actions is not going to work. In fact, the context of Jesus' statement to these people was the fact that the religious leadership of the day had piled on law after law after law upon people and told them that in order to keep God happy and to please God, they had to be meticulous and keep every part of the law so perfectly. And Jesus confronted the religious leaders and he talked to the people about how the religious leaders, in fact, in chapter 23 of Matthew, he says this, they crush people. They crush people. Here's religion in the name of God, crush people with unbearable religious demands, and then they never lift a finger to ease the burden of these things. So the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were all law, no mercy, no justice. 
And they created law upon law to make sure that nobody would break the law of Moses. They wanted to be extra certain that didn't happen. But the problem was they were hypocrites. They themselves, while in form and externally, they appeared like they were doing it well, right? Their hearts, Jesus exposed their hearts and showed that they were trying to find loopholes. And they thought they could maneuver things and work the law and be these good lawyers, right? Where they could expose the weaknesses for their own advantage. And that's what the religious leaders of the day did. So Jesus said to the common people, the people who felt crushed under this trying to earn and merit and make God happy through obedience to the law, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus offers to people to come to him for the rest they need. And as Jesus would continue his journey and then ultimately go to the cross and then die for our place, as Stephen talked about up here this morning, and then raise again. He rises again, proving he is God and finishing salvation. It's finished. It's complete. This gospel of rest that Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I could not live under God's law. And before Jesus came and died for us, the people of the Old Testament, these religious people would go to the temple and offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice year in and year out in order to atone for their sin. But Jesus says, now I give you a time. Just rest in me. I'm the sacrifice. If you want to please God, if you want to be at peace with God, rest in me, Jesus says. A few weeks ago, I was talking to a guy. And he literally said this to me, which, you know, I was a little shocked to hear it because he was very honest. He said, I, I explained to him the gospel and he said, John, are you telling me that all this good stuff that I've been doing and trying to be nice to people and treat people well and be fair and, and kind, I've wasted my time. Like, that's, there's no reason to do that because Jesus did it all for me. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I can't believe I've done all this stuff for no reason. You see, he was grasping the gospel, but misunderstanding the fact that these deeds and these works, they don't do anything to make God happy, but they flow out of a changed heart. In Corinthians, we saw that we're new creations in Christ. And that's what Paul can say, the love of Christ compels me because he was in love with Jesus. Jesus rescued him. Jesus gave him the love of not only in word, but in action, Jesus died. And now Jesus offers, he says, come Connect with me. Harness with me. I'll take the load off you. This load where you're trying to earn it and you're trying to make me happy and do things that maybe at the end of life that you'll stand before God and God will say, well, you had a lot of good works and you had some bad works, but let's see how it's going to measure out. And does it tip the scale for good or evil? That's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. And that's what this guy where I was talking about, he was so weary and he was so beat down because he was trying to earn God's favor and make God, God happy. And there's so many people who have this attitude, and it's nothing new. It's a, it's a ploy that the devil has been using from the very beginning. When Paul and others went and started churches in the early centuries, when Jesus had died and risen again and returned to heaven, they began to start churches, and they talked about the freedom that we have in Christ through what Christ has done for us. In Galatians, Paul says that there's people who were coming in. Look at the verse in chapter 5, verse 1, be on the screen. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So there's that word again, yoke, right? There's this yoke of slavery, which is earning. The religious leaders, the people who said, yeah, Jesus, is, he's good, except Jesus, but, and there's always the but there, right? But you need to yoke yourself to the law. In order to make God happy, not only do you have to be yoked to Jesus, but we need another person here to yoke to, and that's the law. And that's saying that God's only going to be happy as long as you're keeping the rules and you're doing the stuff and you're doing the dance, right? And that's what Paul's exposing, saying, look, you came through Jesus. Don't now run and try to finish this through acts of the law, of obeying the law. And in fact, he says the yoke of slavery is the way he referred to the old covenant system that was there to expose our sin and show us that we need a savior. And so to be included in God's family is not about keeping the law. It's about putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so are you yoked to good works for the sake of trying to make God happy and earn his favor? Are you, are you, is that your mindset? Is that here today sort of like, hey, Easter, I was there in church. 
You know, I'm glad God's happy with me today. God is happy and satisfied with us through Christ and through Christ alone. And Paul says the law was a yoke of slavery, again, because the law reveals our sin and shows us how we fall short. And the law can't make anyone righteous in God's eyes. Only Jesus can do that. By contrast, the yoke of Jesus, while demanding, for sure, is easy because it comes from one who is gentle and lowly in heart. And he says, I can provide you rest, true rest, for your souls. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because you and I, we can't be perfect. And why did Jesus die? He died because we could not do it. Does yoking to Jesus and connecting to Jesus, does harnessing ourselves to Jesus make all of life's problems go away? Absolutely not. And oftentimes when you come to a church that truly teaches the Bible, you have to unlearn some things before you learn the truth. And it's important that you understand and you unlearn the fact that a maybe what I consider a light prosperity gospel that many people are exposed to growing up, which says if you come to Jesus and harness to Jesus, then it's going to be easy street and everything's going to work out and things will just start falling in your favor in life and you're just going to make more money and be happy and your family is just going to be perfectly content and everything's going to always work out. That is not what Jesus offers us. So what does Jesus offer when he says, I give you rest? Here's what he offers you. And this is as practical as, as you're willing to allow it to be in your mind and in your heart. That he offers you peace with God. There's no guilt in life. If you and I, which we will inevitably, leave this place today, and we're going to go out and we're going to either have a bad thought towards someone, we're going to have a negative attitude towards someone, we may even grab our kid and push him in the car because we're angry. We all are going to stumble in many ways. We all are going to, to sin at times because that's just the human condition and that's the flesh that we still battle with and these ideas and thoughts that are in our mind that come into our mind. But we can have total peace with God because we're not just partially forgiven through Jesus Christ. When we harness with Jesus, when we yoke with Jesus, 100% forgiveness. There's 100% forgiveness. The past sins are forgiven Anything that you do today or tomorrow or 10 years from now, in Christ, it's all wiped clean and forgiven. God sees you as holy because of what's called the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, credited to you, to your account. All your sins are forgiven. God is for you. And while there's times in life when bad things happen and you think, God, where are you at? Why are you, what's going on, God? I didn't expect that car wreck to happen. I didn't expect that divorce. I didn't expect these things to happen in my life. Where are you, God? We can know that even through other people's decisions that affect us and even our own self-inflicted wounds that we bring upon ourselves, we know that God promised his children that all things will work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And there are situations in life that I face and that you face that you think, how in the world can God use this for good? Well, I remind myself often, this is not my story. It's God's story. Jesus rose from the dead. I can't raise anyone from the dead. I can't raise anything. Only Jesus can. And Jesus is working his agenda, and he's lovingly invited me into his story and that's all that I ever get to do for the rest of my life. And it never works out the way that the American dream says it should, or I have expectations apart from Jesus that never come to fruition. If none of that happens, I've been blessed more than I can ever imagine, hope for, or dream for, because in Christ I have perfect peace with God, and I will hear him say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. God is for us, not against us. The fear of death is gone. We know that maybe we have 70, 80, 90 years on this earth. We're all going to die. But our lives just continue on for eternity with, with God through Jesus Christ. So why are some Christians not resting? It's a great question because if, you're, if you have that in your mind, maybe you don't attend church super often, you're here today, and you're like, I just see so many Christians, they don't seem like they're very happy, they're miserable. Why? Here's why. If you yoke to Jesus 
and Jesus is the stronger one, and he's the one that's leading and teaching and giving rest, what happens when I begin to pull in a different direction? And I say, God, I know you say this, but I'm going to go look at it this way. What happens? It's miserable, the tension, the frustration that exists in life because we're chasing other things. Back when our kids were small, we went to New York City, and Harrison was just a little guy, five, six, seven years old, and we put a harness on him and took a little leash and hooked it to him so we wouldn't lose him as we walked on the streets of New York City. Because when you're there with your family and you're right there with us, man, it's a joyous time. We're going to go see the, we're going to go see the Empire State Building. We're going to do these great things. We're going on the subway. But what happens? We know that if you stray away from your parents in a place like New York City, it only takes one or two blocks, and all of a sudden, it's a whole different scene, right? It's a completely different atmosphere than being with your parents in the safety of the tourist areas. All of a sudden, you're on some back streets, and things are rough and bad, and people are there to hurt you and advantage, take advantage of you and even put you into slavery as a little ch- child. And so there's great dangers, but you stay tethered to Jesus. And so people don't have rest because they're fighting Jesus, and they're saying, I want to go there, Jesus. And Jesus isn't going to say, no, I'm not letting you go there. Jesus will let you go that direction. He will allow you to make those choices. And it's going to bring great frustration and great stress and misery into your life. In a a devotion I like to read in the mornings, it's called New Morning Mercies. I've read it for many years. And Paul Tripp writes this. He says, you need to remind yourself again and again of his wise and loving control. Not because that will immediately make your life make sense, but because it will give you rest and peace in those moments that all of us face at one time or another when life doesn't seem to make any sense. We need to remind ourselves again and again. And then I want to go back to Corinthians for just a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the part where we left off, and then you'll see why I've taken this metaphor of yoke and used it today because Paul writes this in our text. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Don't harness yourself to unbelievers. Why? For what partnership has righteousness that you're in Christ, you're connected to Christ, you're righteous with lawlessness, just living however you want to live? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what accord does Christ with Belial? And which is a word, a name for Satan. How can Christ and Satan be together? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Do you see what he's saying? Paul's giving us some very, very practical advice here with this yoke idea. How can you as a Christian, as a believer, somebody who names the name of Jesus, be in partnership with someone who's pulling you the other direction? How can, you, how can you live in that way? Whether it's the group of friends you hang out on the weekends with, or whether it's somebody single who you begin to date. Maybe it's a, a business partner even that you know, like, I'm in this arrangement. It's not going to be easy to get out of it, Pastor John, but I feel that tension all the time in this business partnership. He says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And so what practical advice is that for us as Christians? If you want to live victoriously, through the resurrection power of Jesus, then you need to yoke yourself with people who are following Christ and doing the things that Christ wants us to do and living our lives for him. You need to surround yourself with people who will help you follow Jesus versus following lots of other things that may be good things. The social scene or this agenda or these things that we're trying to accomplish in life which aren't part of Jesus' agenda for your life, your story, but instead you're being pulled in that direction by somebody you're unequally yoked to. And these things that Paul are writing to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians are just as practical for us today as they were for them. Because even in the church, you have people who name the name of Christ who are not following Jesus the right way. Why is it, I remember at college, I went to a Christian college. How is it in a school of 12 to 1,500 people that the bad kids find each other like this, right? Like, they just spot each other. There's another kid bad like me. Let me, let me go to that person and find them, right? I mean, it happens. It's, it's crazy how people gravitate to people who are like them. And so maybe think about yourself. If you're gravitating toward 
the people who are not following Jesus, maybe that's more of an indictment upon you than it is upon them, right? That the fact that you keep finding that's your crowd, that's your people, that's your group. Grace Church and other Bible teaching churches in this community, that should be your people. Those are the people you should partner with. And we highlighted our refuge student ministry. We highlighted pursued our college ministry. We highlighted our K group, small group ministry because you need fellow Christians to partner with, to do life with. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable in your life. You're going to be walking with Jesus and then you're going to start pulling this way. And you're like, what is this? I don't feel rest. I don't feel peace. I feel burdened. And Jesus says, because you're fighting against me, let me lead. Here's how you lead. Here's how you let me lead. Yoke up with other believers. Yoke up with people who are following Jesus as well. And so the church in Corinth had all kinds of messy situations and people and bad leaders and people who named the name of Christ that were there just for what they could get from the relationships and the situation. Who do you have a tight bond with? And let me close with this, verse 16. Paul concludes this thought before he quotes an Old Testament passage. He says, for we are the temple of the living God. Let's, let's read that again. We, Christians, believers, those who are harnessed to Jesus, are the temple of the living God. You see what he's saying? This connection, this harnessing, this being hooked to Jesus, yoked to Jesus, is not an external thing. This is a matter of the heart. This is internal. This is the fact that in Christ, God has made you a new creation. You're not the same as you were before Christ. He did a work in you. He transformed your life. He forgave your sins. And now you have different desires. And you're wondering again why you're frustrated. Because you know what Jesus wants for your life. You hear him speaking through the Holy Spirit, through his word, through the church. And you're warring and fighting against him because you think you know better than God. Be aware. God has made you in Christ a new creation. The old is passed away. This old agenda of living for my wants, my needs, what I think I want in life. I now live for Jesus because the new has come. I'm yoked with Jesus. I'm his temple. And those who come to Jesus find rest for their souls because they're 100% righteous in Christ. And we can live for Jesus and follow Jesus and find joy in Jesus. And so here's the application, very simply today. If you're not harnessed to Jesus, place your faith and trust in Jesus today. He says, come, come to me. If you're heavy laden and and burdened, I'm going to give you rest. Come to me, harness yourself to me, take my life to you. Accept my invitation. And the application, the application to those who are believers here today, harness yourself to other believers, the body of Christ. Don't try to be solo. Don't say, I, I can just live the Christian life on my own. I can just, just me and God. I've got a really close relationship with God. I don't really need church because so many hypocrites in this building, right? If you're a hypocrite, raise your hand because we all have moments, right? Yeah, look around. Now, come on. Come on. Raise your hand if you're at times, you're a hypocrite at times, right? We all don't always live out the things we say. We all fail at some points. But the truth is our identity in Christ, we are new creations, and we have been given everything we need for life and godliness in Christ, 2 Peter chapter 1 says. So harness yourself to other Christians. Don't let your Christian life be a disaster because you're fighting against Jesus and you're not spiritually compatible to these other people that are your best partners and friends in life. Harness yourself to God. In just a minute, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We allow anyone, if you're not a member of this church, if you, don't, if you attend another church and you're in town visiting, you're more than welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper today if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For some of you, maybe today is that day. Maybe today, for the first time, the Holy Spirit just got your attention and you said, I want that. I want to be harnessed to Jesus. I am doing life on my own, and it's miserable, and it's terrible, and I feel heavy, and I feel no rest in life. And, and today is the day you call on Jesus. And if you do that, if you call on Jesus, today is the day you take the Lord's Supper and celebrate what he's done for you in a, in a great way, kind of like Forrest can celebrate it with his baptism today. You have a special celebration. If you're in here today and you just have questions, you want to get committed, connected, I'm sorry, to some other believers, you want to be part of a group, you want some discipleship in your life, you want other Christian friends, Stephen, again, will be standing in the lobby, he and Allison, he'll have a little card he can give you that you can fill out, 
and you can turn it into him, and it'll help us get in touch with you and help you get connected to a group here, all right? So I hope you'll follow through and do that. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God just to, our time in the Lord's Supper, just to take that and use it in your life, to draw you closer to him and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his power today. And when I'm done with our prayer, this prayer, I'm going to ask our elders to come up and join me. And then we're, we're going to serve you today. So you don't need to get up today. We will bring the elements to you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. And those of us who have been believers for many years, God, it's easy sometimes to forget the difference it makes to being harnessed to you, God, that you lead us and you guide us, you give us perspective you help us through the difficulties of life to help us understand that it's not about us, that we live for you and your glory, and in that we find incredible joy and satisfaction and peace and rest. And God, I thank you for the rest that you offer, and I pray for those who are struggling, thinking they can earn your favor, they can do things to make you happy, help them to remember, and keep in mind the gospel of rest, which is that they cannot keep you happy. It's only through Jesus that happiness is found and peace with you is found. And God, may they put their faith and trust in you today. And those who have, God, I pray you'll give us just the knowledge and remind ourselves that we're in perfect harmony with you, that you're for us and not against us because of Jesus. And that life that you've given us in Christ changes everything about us. And I pray as we harness with our church believers, fellow believers, and fellow church members, God, help us to live for your glory and point people to you and invite other people to come to you, Jesus. In your name we pray.